Solar is undergoing insane exponential growth made possible by the fact that unlike almost any other energy source, solar gets cheaper the more that we use it. Let's say that one more time. Solar gets cheaper the more we use it. And as it gets cheaper, we use even more of it than before. And it gets cheaper still. And around and around and around we go until most of our energy comes from solar. In this video, we explore how solar has about six traits that make it really unusual as an energy source. And combined with the incredible speed at which we are ramping up production and installation of solar power, solar is going to be an extremely disruptive technology in the decades to come. Now, if we're talking about disruptive technology, solar panels can seem pretty disappointing. Solar panels aren't really advancing technologically in any way. They're not really getting any better. Solar panels are a commodity. You buy them based on price. What's disruptive is that we're getting way better at making solar panels. In fact, the rates at which we are manufacturing and installing solar panels are doubling every three years and increasing by 10 times every decade. That means for every solar panel that you see today, in 10 years, there will be 10 solar panels. These are gonna be plastered everywhere everywhere because they're so damn cheap. Now I want to get in front of all the haters who are going to say things like, well, you, how can you rely on solar if the sun doesn't shine all the time? How will our transmission infrastructure deal with the inconsistency? Solar isn't perfect and it will cause some problems, but we're going to figure it out because fundamentally solar is promising copious amounts of really cheap electricity. The strategy with solar is simple. You place the solar panel in a place where the sun shines some of the time, not all the time, because a lot of the time it's nighttime and there's no sun by definition. So you put the solar panel somewhere where the sun shines some of the time and then you get electricity. And yeah, you have to find a cheap way to store the electricity so you can use it even when the sun's not shining. And we don't exactly have the cheap part nailed down yet, but there's reason for optimism. In theory, you could make batteries out of sodium, which is right below lithium on the periodic table. So it's got a lot of the same properties that make lithium good for a battery. It's just heavier, but also way more abundant and therefore way cheaper. But if the batteries aren't moving, if no one has to carry them around, being heavy isn't really a problem. So yeah, we're banking on an assumption that we found a cheap way to store all the solar electricity. And then the sun goes away, and the next day it comes back, and you get electricity again. And it happens over and over and over. And it might be your job to make sure that there isn't a bunch of shit obstructing your solar panels, because that will fuck up its potential for sure. So you might have to go out there and clear off some snow or... Maybe there's a dead bird on the solar panel and you gotta clear it off. Or maybe just a lot of, you know, grime accumulates and you go out there with some Windex and fucking clean it off. But for the most part, day over day over day, solar will just keep making more electricity every time the sun hits it and you don't have to think about it. Nobody has to shovel more coal into the furnace. They don't have to figure out where to store radioactive waste from a nuclear plant over and over and over. We just put these things absolutely fucking everywhere and just let them keep making electricity. That's pretty much it. Maybe at some point they stop working after decades, I don't know, and you throw them out and get new ones. That's it. But this past summer, The Economist published a cover story called The Dawn of the Solar Age, and the stats in the article blew my fucking mind. And I decided to make a video regurgitating a lot of the information. See, you don't have to read this shit. And the punchline is that solar is growing at insane exponential rates that have defied even the most optimistic predictions. We now produce twice as many solar panels in one single day than we did in an entire year. 20 years ago in 2004, nobody saw that coming. That's crazy. The current projections are that solar will create more electricity than all the world's nuclear plants by 2026, create more electricity than all the world's gas plants by 2030, and they'll create more electricity than all the world's coal plants by 2032. And what's even crazier is the projection is that by the 2040s, solar alone will not just be the largest source of electricity, but of all primary energy sources. That includes burning gasoline to power cars, 
That includes burning kerosene to power airplanes. That includes burning diesel to power ships or burning coal to melt iron and make steel. That's crazy. Now, I was talking to a friend of mine who works in clean tech and he cynically and correctly pointed out that The Economist might be about seven years behind on proclaiming that we are in the dawn of the solar age. As he pointed out in about 2017, that's when on a per kilowatt hour basis, solar power became cheaper than fossil fuels. At that time, solar made up about less than 1% of all the electricity we were producing. So it's hard to really get too excited about the idea that we were entering into the dawn of the solar age. But now that solar makes up about 6% of all the electricity we produce globally, it's a lot easier to see that the dawn of the solar age has indeed begun because that 6% number is about to become a much larger piece of the pie. This brings us to our list of six traits that make solar a very unusual source of energy. Starting with trait one. The most important property of solar is that it gets cheaper the more that we use it. No other energy source has gotten cheaper the more we use it. And that will likely make it make economic sense to start using energy to do things that we currently don't think it's a good economic use of our energy to do. But more on that at the end of the video. If you compare solar to coal, which we started using in large quantities at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in the 18th century to power steam engines, create mechanical energy using coal, and also to melt iron and blast furnaces and create steel, it didn't take very long before we realized that if you use the energy of coal, you can profit. And therefore, it makes sense to spend even more money burning even more coal and use even more energy. And so we started using way more coal, but when adjusted for inflation, the price of coal really hasn't changed that much. Coal has never really gotten cheaper. We just realized it was profitable to use a lot more of it. Solar energy is getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper the more of it we use that is enabling its insane exponential growth. Now, it's also true that China is making solar panels artificially cheap. China is subsidizing the expansion of manufacturing capacity for solar. In particular, they're focused on scaling up the production of polysilicon. Almost all the world's polysilicon, which is kind of the black material, is produced in China. Polysilicon is super high purity silicon, comes from sand or quartz. It's essentially the exact same material that's in computer chips, although the computer chips require probably an even higher degree of purity than solar panels do. Solar panels can be a little cheaper. This is part of China's energy strategy. China has a billion and a half people they use massive amounts of energy. They're the world's second largest economy. China does have some of their own fossil fuels domestically. In particular, they have quite a lot of coal, but at the end of the day, they are a net fossil fuel importer. And so for China, expanding solar is a path for them to become energy independent and also sell solar panels all over the world. The second property of solar is that solar is commodified. That means that you buy solar panels based on price, primarily. This solar panel is made by a brand called Flex Solar. I had never heard of Flex Solar until I bought this solar panel on Prime Day. I bought this solar panel because it was the cheapest one putting out the amount of energy that I wanted. In all greater likelihood, we are not going to be buying solar panels based on what brand they are. We're not gonna care if Apple or Samsung or Panasonic or Sony or any of these electronic companies that we're used to buying stuff from, we don't really care if they're making solar panels because solar panels are all pretty much the same. They're commodified. We are gonna buy them mostly based on price. That's very unusual. That also makes solar very competitive. Solar is also extremely modular, meaning that you can deploy solar at any scale. You can use solar to power tiny little calculator with little solar panels up top. I got this solar powered calculator for about $3.50. That's a testament to how cheap all these electronics are getting. They're getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, almost to the point of being free, which is crazy. You can deploy solar at the scale of creating this portable charger, which I bought. It's got USB ports in it. So when I go to a jam band music festival, and suddenly I'm living in complete squalor, I can still charge my phone or maybe my Apple Watch and feel good about the fact that I'm minimizing my footprint on the environment. Or you can have solar cover a building, maybe a shopping mall, or you can put solar panels out in the desert 
and produce huge amounts of electricity that way. It doesn't matter what scale you're operating at, you just buy more of these or less of these. There really isn't any other energy source you can do that with. Unusual trait number four. Solar is also relatively untethered to geography. While your solar potential varies somewhat based on how far north or south you are relative to the equator or how cloudy your place is on average, everywhere on Earth gets some amount of solar potential and it's all fairly predictable. But not everywhere on Earth has oil underground or deposits of shale rock where you can frack for natural gas. That is a lot more unevenly dispersed than solar energy is. Trait five. Solar is also not at all dependent on infrastructure to move solar energy around. Sure, there's a lot of concerns about how the grid is unprepared to handle the unpredictable loads from solar energy, but the reality is you can deploy solar super locally even in the absence of huge transmission lines, which are pretty expensive to build. For most of you watching this video, that doesn't really matter that much because you probably have plenty of access to electricity and never really have to think about it. And you take electrical infrastructure for granted, as do I. But there are a lot of people around the world who don't have electricity at all. Apparently there are 600 million people living in Africa who don't have any electricity in their homes whatsoever. It's pretty unlikely that utility companies, at least on any significant scale, are going to invest a lot building electrical infrastructure to electrify all these far-flung parts of Africa that don't have a lot of economic potential. But as things like this, a solar panel that's got USB ports into it, get cheaper and cheaper. I mean, this was already like 25 or $30 for me. Soon it's gonna become possible for people who currently don't have any electricity at all to buy something like this and suddenly they're in business. They can do stuff like get a solar panel, maybe like a little power bank, battery, one of these USB lights. Suddenly you can plug in the light, power it off your little battery, which you charge the solar panel and your kids at night can read and study, become educated. That might not sound like a big deal to you or me, but I assure you, portable solar is a game changer for the many people around the world who don't have any electricity at all. And I think potentially the most interesting feature of solar is that it's going to be almost impossible to monopolize electricity. You probably get your electricity by paying a big local utility company to deliver it to your house. In all greater likelihood, you have no ability to shop around, find a different utility company that's providing electricity a little bit cheaper, you use the only utility company around and pay whatever they want. In New York, I've got Con Ed. Con Ed charges 29 cents a kilowatt hour, which comparatively is very expensive for electricity. And I pay it because there's no other option. But if you can cover your roof or your land in these, and you've got some battery storage, it's possible that you can generate all the energy that you need, even when the sun's not shining, and you don't need any utility company at all. That's cool. The big question is what's the consequence for dramatically expanding our supply of solar energy? And The Economist story has this quote, which is that once you start to think of energy being really copious and all but free, at least sometimes and in some places, brute force approaches to all sorts of problems begin to appear. Brute force approaches to all sorts of problems begin to appear. So this is really where it gets interesting. What do the next few decades look like if we are producing vastly more electricity and it's cheaper than ever? Now it's predicted that as AI increases, we are gonna start using a lot more computational power. We're gonna build more data centers. They're gonna use a lot more electricity. That's predictable. It's also projected that electric vehicles are gonna become a lot more common and they will soak up a lot of this extra electricity we're producing. But what's gonna be really interesting to see is how will we use electricity in ways that we don't predict yet. Maybe we will start using electricity for things that don't really make economic sense today, but if electricity becomes a lot cheaper and more abundant, all of a sudden it might make economic sense. One simple example of that is using electricity to split water, to create hydrogen. Hydrogen is the most energy dense fuel possible. If you really had enough electricity, you could produce hydrogen at huge scales just by running electricity through water. You could conceivably use that hydrogen to replace kerosene and power airplanes or create steel using hydrogen. That's something that makes absolutely no economic sense today, but in the future, just a few decades from now, when we're producing copious amounts of solar energy and it's super cheap, all of a sudden that could become possible. 
Or maybe we just spend a lot more energy mining Bitcoin, which I think would be pretty fucking lame, but also wouldn't shock me. My name's Will. I'm a video producer. I get paid to point cameras, like this one, at famous people. But at the end of the day, I want to make videos about more interesting shit. And so I'm making these videos about technology, because I love technology. I am immersed in it. I read about it. And I want to share interesting things that I learned about, like from the Economist Dawn of the Solar Age article, with you. So hit subscribe, and I will try to make more videos to help you learn. I know your time is valuable, and there's a lot of other things you could watch. You could watch Netflix or Disney Plus or OnlyFans. And here you are watching my videos. And I just want to say I don't take that for granted. Thank you so much for spending your time here on the Will Chilton YouTube channel.